मजुमदार डॉक्टर विद्या एम्बेसडर देवरे डिस्टिंगुश गेस्ट लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन सिविलाइजेशनल लिंकेजेस इन द इंडियन ओशन आर 5000 इयर्स ओल्ड दे वर नर्चर्ड बाय आर एंसेस्टर्स हु सेल्ड द वाटर्स ऑफ दीज ओशंस एंड लिंक्ड डाइवर्स पीपल टुगेदर इमेजिन दोज लॉन्ग वॉयजेस many of them difficult frequently dangerous where different people in the same boat a fragile vessel talk to each other about families about their religion about their beliefs about their stories and exchanged humor and and also stories of tragedy this is how a cultural ethos was structured and has remained resilient for all these centuries it was interrupted to some extent with the advent of european colonialism which is now about 500 years old when vasco da gama entered the waters of the indian ocean it was initially a voyage of discovery but very rapidly became a voyage of conquest and destruction you should recall that after the first voyage he conducted two more voyages in the first one he killed a large number of coastal people fisher people and in the third one he burnt a hut ship and several hundred people were burned to death he was signaling to the people of the indian ocean that western imperialism had arrived for the last 200 years we experienced the hegemony of the united kingdom and france and a pervasive western order was then put in place in the world that order is today in distress it is being questioned in the very countries from where it had been uh, from where it had emerged there is a crisis of globalization because it is now recognized that globalization is the privilege of a few not more than 10% of the people benefit from the flows of technology of information of finance and are fit enough to be employed well beyond their own national borders today you have a questioning of this in the shape of increasing disorder within western states a rising you have questioning of a democratic system that is largely influenced by lobbies and interest groups you have large numbers of people who recognize that they are not part of the western success story and are today rebelling and their vote is being mobilized you had first the experience of brexit and now you have the experience of the trump presidency you have of course a nervousness in most of these states because they are experiencing insecurity because of because of the scourge of terrorism this terrorism was largely nurtured by the western interventions in west asia and this is now an assault upon them who are the fathers of this terrorism a capitalist system is under question as well because it has been found to be corrupt at the core and it is largely based on crony capitalism and then finally most dangerous of all you find that the values of enlightenment that used to shape western civilization are themselves being questioned in the countries from where they had emerged and today you have racism which is rampant and a dislike of people different from you assertions not of national identity but of sub national identity and sub sub national identity is now at the fore and politicians cynically are exploiting these divisions and these divides but the challenge to the west ladies and gentlemen is not just internal extraordinary changes have taken place in the lands that they had dominated earlier and there is now a shift in world power there is today a del there is a shift from the west to the east we today already have in china 
a major industrial power. We know that in a few years, perhaps possibly 10 years, Asia will have two-thirds of the world's population. A very extraordinary achievement compared to what you will find in the aging populations of the West. Three of the four world's largest economies are in Asia. Asia will, Asia is, will take over the combined economic output of Europe and North America within the decade to 2020. This is from, this is from Gideon Rackman's book, Easternization. You will have, China will be the largest economy very shortly and twice the size of the US economy. The Indian economy will be a close third and at par with the US economy at that time. By, 20, by 2030, near at our time, Asia will have surpassed North America and Europe combined in terms of global power based on GDP, population size, military spending, and technological investment. <coughs> We've already experienced over the last 20 years extraordinary connectivities across Asia. We are trading much more with each other. We are buying, we are the principal buyers of West Asian energy. We are investing much more in each other's economies. And many more of our people are crossing national borders and working across the region. We have 8 million Indians who live in West Asia, for instance. How did this come about? This came about because of the rise of China and India as economic powers with high growth rates. It emerged because of their, their demand for extraordinary demand for energy that came from West Asia. So that West Asia is today supplying about 60% of, uh, is supplying about 60% of its production now goes to Asia rather than to Europe. And of course the emergence of Central Asian republics as sovereign entities in their own right. This is already a virtual Silk Road had already come into being. And this is a revival of the old Silk Roads that had connected this region across the land as well as across the seas. We are recovering our heritage. We are recovering as the West retreats. We are recovering our own heritage that was interrupted by Western imperialism. But now we are looking at physical connectivities as well. We are not just confining ourselves to virtual connectivities. We are very poorly connected with each other because imperialism ensured that our principal connections were with the West. We are therefore now looking at how we can benefit from the resources that are available within our own continent and within our own ocean space. We are looking at various projects. We have the Chinese project, Obor, One Belt, One Road. It is a Chinese initiative, but it will be realized by the participation of Asian countries working together. The resources are beyond the capacity of a single country. It is an imaginative project that demands that we work together. Every part of West Asia, uh, every part of Asia is looking at connectivities today all across the GCC, where you have good roads, you don't have good connection. You can only travel by air, primarily. They are looking at railroad systems. You are looking at gas pipelines that will transport gas from the areas which are rich in gas to those that need gas. So you are looking at transportation from Iran into Oman and from Oman to different parts of Asia. You are looking at our own projects with which India is associated. This is the Obor. This has two parts. This is the land route, which roughly replicates the old Silk Road with a diversion to Moscow. And then, of course, you have the, uh, you have the maritime connectivity that is right across. I want to make it clear that these are just proposals. These are drawings on the map. They need all of Asia to participate to realize them. But this is something that will qualitatively transform the geography and the economics of our region. This is something very close to us, the development of Chabahar port and the road that will go from Chabahar up to Afghanistan. It will go to Iran, up to Zahedan, and then go 
into Afghanistan. India will therefore have a direct connection with Afghanistan that is denied to us at this point. The, again, the development of Gwadar, of Chabahar port, is of great significance, both politically, strategically, and of course, economically as well. Look at this connection. This is the extension of the old route, where you can connect all the countries of Central Asia, from Chabahar, and from the other ports of Iran, so that India no longer has to go through Pakistan and, and is now denied access, which was historically present through the Khyber Pass. We were part of the Silk Road, the old Silk Road. That is not possible today. This is the alternative route that is today being pursued by us. And then, of course, you have this extraordinary imaginative North-South Transit Corridor, which will take India, which will, which will take India, connect it to Moscow, through Iran, and from Moscow, it will go to West Europe. These are the new things that are being looked at by us and which are part of the new Silk Roads of the 21st century. I am not going to pretend to you that things are going to be easy. There are competitions, there are rivalries, there are conflictual situations that we have inherited. Some of theirs are a product of colonialism, others are products of the Cold War, and some we have to deal with them. It is, it, we cannot ignore them. We have issues relating with, to Pakistan, the Pakistani role in Afghanistan, the Sino-Indian border issue, the problems that, we, that, that many countries have with Chinese claims in the South China Sea, the Saudi-Iran strategic competition that has emerged and because of which you have two major conflicts in West Asia, one in Syria and the other in Yemen, and of course you have the scourge of jihad and sectarianism which are partly a product of what was done, uh, what had been done by three cynical powers, United States, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan, to mobilize a global jihad in Afghanistan. The world is paying the price for this cynical enterprise that gave birth to one of the most powerful jihadi movements that you have and who are still with us. India has very deep interest in West Asia. 80% of our oil comes from there, as does a large quantum of our gas. It is a major trade partner. It's in the first three. It is our major, it's a number one export destination for India. It has, we have 8 million people who live in the six countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council. And we have all those logistical projects that we have looked at. Are any of them possible? if there is a real conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and that this proxy conflict becomes a real conflict. This is, the great, this is the great challenge for us. If we are going to speak of the Asian century and the resurgence of Asia, Asian countries have to take responsibility for their own security. We have found a scenario, we have had a scenario where Western interventions and depredations have destroyed entire nations, killed millions of people, and have ravaged historic cities. We today have to take responsibility to see that this is not allowed to happen again. I propose here to you that India, starting at a track two process, but then moving on to a track one process, must be directly involved and lead a diplomatic initiative to promote confidence building between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And over a period of time, once this confidence has been achieved, to work with the nations uh, with, with the and to work with the nations of the region and promote a collective security arrangement. This collective this effort will be diplomatic, it will be inclusive in the sense that any country that wishes to participate in this imaginative scheme will be, uh, will be invited, and it will be incremental in that it will take time to achieve. So I am not suggesting that you give up your existing security engagements that you might say. Again, one does not pretend that there are no challenges. There are deep-seated divisions between Saudi Arabia and Iran. One perceives an existential threat from the other, and it is, feels extremely vulnerable in terms of its strategic interests in the region. Of course, I have proposed that India should lead an Asian, uh, that India should lead an Asian initiative. It should shape an Asian initiative that includes China, Japan, and Republic of Korea. 
in the first instance. Yes, we have Sino-Indian differences. We have some of them bilateral, some of them in regard to their actions in third countries, some of them in regard to a neighborhood that we consider important. But here there is conversions of interests. Both the countries have very, very significant stakes in regard to the security of West Asia. And this is what we have to work towards. We, and of course, we have the greatest challenge of our, the enemy of new thoughts, of new ideas, is us. We are resistant, mortally resistant, to a fresh idea put before us. And we tend to spontaneously reject it because it has never been thought of before. Yes, it has not been thought of before because we were dominated by Western powers who did not give us the autonomy of action that we now have to assume. We now have to take the responsibility for our own interests. But I would also say to you that there are very significant strengths. Firstly, we are looking at a hydrocarbon future, at least till 2040, if not beyond. All major countries of Asia are energy, depend, energy import dependent. And West Asian conflict, as it escalates, threatens the interests of all of us in Asia. There will be no growth rates if we do not have energy from this region that is now convulsed with so much violence. India with its historic connection. We know that the civilizational linkages that I started with were actually anchored in India. India provided the wood for those boats. India provided the coir for, so that we could have boats in Oman. India worked closely with its brethren in Oman. While the Omanis dominated the navigation of the Indian Ocean for 2,000 years, their partners were the Indians, just as they are partners today in various other bilateral enterprises and in bringing peace and stability to the region is a priority for both countries at present. Our Prime Minister has already given us the direction. Two years ago, he spoke in Brazil and he said, he spoke about the scenario, the security scenario in the region. And he said, remaining mute spectators to countries being torn up in this way can have grave consequences. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the challenge that we face. All of us, we face in India. But the opportunity is there. The Western order is declining. Chris Patton wrote this sentence, the first sentence that is there, with the victory of Donald Trump, because he thought that the Western order was now going to disappear. And he speaks of the Western order as sustaining peace, boosting prosperity. Whose peace and whose prosperity? Certainly not of the people of Asia. Certainly not of the people of the Indian Ocean. All their major wars were fought in our continent and in our Indian Ocean. So let us get rid of this old order. Let us also remember, ladies and gentlemen, that imperialism does not give up. If you have, if they, their view is, if you cannot beat them, divide them. The idea of the Asia-Pacific was first conceived as an American initiative in order to keep India out and to ensure that China was tamed in a West-dominated order. But when China would not be tamed, they have invented a new artificial, completely bogus construct. It is called India-Pacific. Why should it be India-Pacific? Why not the Indian Ocean? Why are you excluding West Asia from the, from, from the India-Pacific? We should not accept that we should become pawns in the various, uh, in the various initiatives that the West might have. But then I end with a remark again of Gideon Rachman, who has said there is a strong relationship with the emergence and the rise of economic power and international political power. This has happened before. In many times in the past, as new powers have emerged, there has been a certain disruption in the international system or in the regional system. And there have been sometimes conflicts as well. There is, it is not inevitable that there should be conflict, but it is inevitable that we will have disruption because the West will be resisting every effort that we make to pursue autonomously what is our heritage and to reshape what defined our character, defined our ethos, and defined us as people for 5,000 years, the Indian Ocean community.